Welcome to PeerPoint Perspectives, the securities finance podcast delivering commentary from the best, brightest and most innovative people in the world of securities lending, repo, collateral management and related areas. PeerPoint Perspectives is brought to you by the consulting team at PeerPoint Financial. So now over to your host. Hello and welcome to episode 5 of PeerPoint Perspectives. I'm your host Roy Zimmerhansel and practice lead at PeerPoint. Today we're going to look at a topic that's the primary driver for the existence of securities lending, short selling. Now not every securities loan is tied to short selling, but certainly every short sale on the equity side is tied to securities lending even if it's going through the qualifying process to meet regulatory standards whereby a would-be short seller has to locate securities before contemplating executing a short sale. The practice has been around for hundreds of years and it's now a standard part of pretty much every developed market. It's even been rolled out in many developing markets in recent years and yes that's after the short selling bans that were applied during the global financial crisis in 2008. I'm talking about markets such as Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, and Nigeria, for example. But despite this clear regulatory acceptance and numerous academic studies validating the contribution that securities lending brings to markets, many people have an almost pathological aversion to the practice. In fact, I was stunned to recently read comments from a leading UK fund manager questioning whether price discovery was really all that important. The article was relating to short selling and whether it it benefited markets. I was stunned. A fund manager questioning whether price discovery was important? My guest today is someone who I've watched for many years and had the pleasure of meeting about a decade ago. He also happily obliged when I asked him to teach a short selling course for my training company many years ago. The reason I wanted him on the show is that he ticks all the boxes for credibility. Check out this list. Academics. He has a PhD and has been senior lecturer in finance. Check. Professional qualifications. He's a CFA charter holder. Check. Professional experience. He's previously held senior roles at Scottish Widows, Aberdeen Asset Management and Murray Johnson. And he's been responsible for both long-only funds and long-short equity funds. Check. So I'm not sure how he could be any more qualified to be educating me about short selling and sharing his thoughts with uh, my listeners. He's currently employed at Jupiter Asset Management, where he is head of strategy, Absolute Return, and manages the Jupiter Absolute Return Fund and Jupiter Global Asset Return Fund. And as I mentioned at the end of our last podcast, he's literally the man who wrote the book on short selling. In fact, he's written two, Predatory Trading and Crowded Exits, and Short Selling, an Evidence-Based Introduction. I'll be leaving uh, details on both of those in the show notes. So without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce my guest, James Clooney. Good morning, James, and welcome to the podcast. Great. Thank you, Roy. Hello. So listen, thanks for joining us today. And and let's just jump straight into, I guess, the psychology of short selling. So why are there such strongly held views from people about short sellers? It's a really interesting question, and it's perplexed people for many years. Um, I remember doing a a series of interviews with people um, just over a decade ago, asking why is it so rare? Why is it so emotional? And I think well, there are many reasons, but but I think some of the key ones are that people find it somewhat unnatural to be negative when it comes to shares or assets in general. They find it uh, somewhat unpatriotic or, or or against the grain, and that's a very hard way to to think when the majority of the cohort are positive or upward looking. Um, other reasons are that it's quite technical. It's quite difficult to understand the concept of selling something you don't own and then trying to buy it back later to cover your position. The mechanics are difficult, but also it's risky. There's a limit to how much you can make in short selling. 
uh, about 100%, uh, but there's no limit to how much you can lose. Uh, and that risk profile is very scary for people and suggests that it's a speculative or trading or odd kind of behavior. So those are some of the reasons, but it just seems uh, against the grain in the main, uh, risky and technical and complicated to most people. So thanks, Ed. and and I guess a lot of that makes sense, right? You can you can see the average person thinking in those terms, but what always amazes me is the the fact that people think that having a negative view about a stock is uh, somehow I, you described it and included unpatriotic in there. But look, what I don't get is every time that someone uh, buys a stock from someone else they're expressing a different opinion from the person selling the stock. So I, I, uh, it, it's always boggled my mind. That's, that's a great point. And actually, the, the concept behind short selling is really simple. All it is is the expression of a negative opinion on the price of an asset. And if you think about it, why should stocks always be underpriced relative to some expectation or fair value? Why shouldn't they be roughly half overpriced and half underpriced at any moment? So it is, it is a very simple concept. And when you think of it in those ways, you think, well, why isn't it a substantial part of the stock market? Uh, why aren't there as many short sellers as long only investors? Um, and put that way, it seems a much more ordinary and sensible activity. Yeah, well, I guess if you define a market as a place where prices are determined based on a collection of opinions, that's actually exactly what you've just described. People yes. think, and of course, like those differences of opinions and people being willing to act on those differences of opinions are what creates liquidity. Yeah. So again, so do you look? I, I think this this is an age old debate. Uh, I, I think at a conference in two thousand and Eight, about a month after Lehman, I, I effectively said there isn't any point in us arguing publicly about short selling being accepted because I don't think it ever will be. A a am I wrong? I'm, I'm not certain I've changed my point of view, although I, I do spend a ridiculous amount of time on, on forums sometimes <laughs> arguing the case. W will people ever accept short selling? I, I think it'll always be like this, where during steady, stable times, it's accepted as a practice that tends to boost market liquidity in general and tends to help with price discovery. But during times of stress, people like to find somebody to blame for their woes. And short sellers are a pretty convenient group. They have negative opinions, which suggests that they want things to go wrong. And um, they are less uh, publicity seeking than, than many long only investors, uh, because obviously they have to cover their positions at some point in the future. And so in a sense, uh, people who uh, are negative and less visible are a very easy group to blame. Uh, and so I, I think it'll, it'll look like this. It'll cycle back and forth between tolerated and disliked, tolerated and disliked. But as you mentioned earlier, Roy, the, the evidence is fairly clear. All the big studies of what short selling does for markets suggest that on average, short selling helps with uh, improving liquidity and improving price discovery. In other words, the moves in share price are more random where short selling is allowed and more uh, are predictable or correlated, uh, autocorrelated when short selling is prohibited. And those are good things. And that's what regulators want. They want markets that are liquid and properly functioning. Um, the problem with short selling is that although that's on average uh, how it plays out, there are times when it can be abused, when it can be used to move shares away from fair value. We don't know what proportion, but in my mind, I think of it as a kind of 90-10 sort of thing. Uh, and because it can be abused, it's very difficult to rebut any accusation put against short sellers. But on average, in the main, short selling makes markets better, and it does what regulators want uh, um, to, to make markets properly functioning. That's one of their roles as the regulator. Thanks. I think there's probably three different things that come from uh, what you described there. One of the other things I've heard regulators uh, ask about and consider, and then eventually some of them have embraced, is the other thing that it brings to the market is um, lower peaks and lower troughs in market cycles because 
as as markets are peaking, the short sellers are getting more and more excited, creating bigger positions, and then even even people that are more long biased tend to start putting hedges in place at sort of the index level. So it kind of stops the irrational exuberance at the top. And then as markets are crashing and falling through uh, through the floor, the short sellers are obviously the the only buyers left, and so that the trough isn't quite as uh, as deep. Does that so that's theoretically the kind of things we discuss. Does that does that really play out in real life? Uh, mostly, but not always. Uh, again, it might be one of these ninety ten things. So that's what I've been trying to do. I've been trying to find assets that look overpriced or completely devoid of sort of rationality relative to likely future cash flows and short in them. That's been difficult. If you can take an overpriced stock, uh, which has some kind of fragility or negative catalyst and short it, um, you'd think it would fall. But actually, this has been a very interesting environment the last few years when a lot of loss making companies with earnings downgrades, balance sheet woes have actually gone higher and higher still. So the short seller is helping to control that until the point that he or she has underperformed for so long that the clients fire them and then they're forced to buy it back at the peak, actually exacerbating the problem. So under ordinary circumstances, it works, but in extremis, it can actually uh, force you to do the opposite of what you want to do and you exacerbate uh, that. On the way down, Again, if I look at my, my own actions, I was a buyer of shares in March and, and took my fund from slightly net short to slightly net long because I saw sh stock prices fall towards fair value in a number of the shares where I was short. So in March, I was out there buying stock, uh, short covering. And again, that helps to control the panic in the market. And that's a good thing. But it could have been different. It could have been that actually, if clients were redeeming um, uh, some of their positions with me, that I would be forced to actually do the the opposite. So, or you know, so that it, all sorts of things could have happened in extremis. But I think what short sellers generally do in reasonably controlled markets is they try to sell the stuff that's frothy um, and um, then try to buy back when things have collapsed down to something closer to fair value. So again, usually good for markets, can be unhelpful in an extremis. So in that, in that situation, I guess, uh, you know, I, I read from time to time about um, alternative funds where uh, the portfolio managers in their, their regular investor letters will send messages out to customers saying, look, we've got a we've got a real conviction short here, yet the market continues to rise. And so we've lost a little bit of money, but we feel pretty good about it. And you watch it over time and they say, well, we still feel good about it, but the market isn't isn't agreeing with us. And then, uh, you know, I've read a couple of times where people said, that's it, we're not shorting anymore. So is it is it just personally challenging to be a short seller? I think it's very challenging to be a short seller. Um, if you think about it, a, a lot of short sellers are actually long and short at the same time. Uh, in other words, it might be some kind of market neutral or variable beta fund. And in a sense, the long side is probably investment, whereas the short side, because you're looking for catalysts before shorting and you're considering stop losses and other risk management tools, is a lot more trading oriented, watching the screen price, um, position sizing. And to do investment and trading simultaneously is more of a challenge than just being, say, an investor with a three or five year time horizon or just being a pure trader. So I think the combination of those different time horizons across longs and shorts uh, and different emphasis on catalysts and stop losses on the short side are, are challenging. I think as well, obviously, if you think about it, markets tend to go up in the sense that you earn an equity risk premium. So you receive dividends or share prices rise. And therefore, the expected return on a random short is negative. And therefore, uh, a short seller with no skill will actually be constantly losing money or sorry, lo uh, uh, losing money over the long term. And that obviously creates a, a lot of stress. So the short seller has to be good to survive uh, because of that negative expected return and needs to be able to hold investment and trading approaches simultaneously in their work. And do they need to be lucky as well? 
I think so. I mean, if you think about, uh, you know, one of my colleagues described me as, as a really unlucky short seller because um, although I did a lot of training and research from 2003 onwards, uh, I didn't get my hands on my first long short equity fund until 2009. And now 11 and a bit years into a bull market, <laughs> I'm kind of wishing I'd never heard of short selling. So it's like to, to, to short for 11 years in a bull market is, is slightly unlucky. It would be, it'd be great to just start as a short seller about now, I think, would be quite a nice time actually to be a fresh short seller without that uh, multi-year stress and pain and dripping of, of sort of uh, – uh, the, the challenges that this market's thrown out. But uh, I, I don't suspect it's ever easy at all. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, in hindsight, it's always uh, it's always great to find spots where it might have been a great time to, uh, to start a fund. But look, it seems to me that uh, people shouldn't have been surprised that after the historic 11-year bull run that you talked about, we also had an equally uh, historic and challenging uh, market drop-off. I mean... Who was surprised? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 a lot of very uh, experienced, thoughtful commentators have for years uh, been writing about fragilities in the system. Um, every, everything from you know debt levels, debt being a sign of risk or fragility. Uh, everything from sort of you know the negative convexity machine of the, the, the U.S. market to valuations. If you have high valuations and high leverage in a system, um, and um, all sorts of sort of traditional challenges, you basically got something that's fragile. And if you have something that's fragile and you wait long enough, it'll break. So um, I, I don't think it's, it's too much of a surprise that something came along. I always get asked, what's the catalyst for this to work? What's going to happen, James? And uh, of course, I never know. Um, and I say, well, it could be this, it could be that, it could be this. But, but the mere fact that, that there are so many possible catalysts for a break in market conditions, um, if you I suggest to me that something will come along. So I think a highly levered, highly valued system is vulnerable. And I think this should be a really interesting time to be a short seller. And again, from a client perspective, clients are looking to diversify and balance risks. And if they have uh, long equity positions or uh, growth equity positions, I think sort of balancing those off with some value or some short selling positions, I think could actually, if the manager is skilled, actually be very additive in the long term. Yeah, you've touched on something that really surprises me here. Right? Because fortunately, I'm not encumbered by any sort of knowledge or experience on this. But I would have thought that after such a precipitous fall in the market, that a lot of the stocks that were overvalued are less overvalued or maybe even fairly valued. So you're saying there's still shorting opportunities that present themselves today? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I've observed the, the market moves in the last few months, and some of them uh, they make total sense. You know, you say, well, absolutely, this changed, the stock price fell by that amount. I understand that. But there are other stocks where the moves are, are just beyond comprehension. You know, really highly rated stocks with, say, a really poor balance sheet or increasing competition, big earnings downgrades that persist, and the shares hit record highs. And I can see them in Japan or in the USA, some in the UK, and I, I'm, I'm slightly bewildered. But rather than be bewildered, I think the thing to do is to lean slightly against them and regard this as a gift and opportunity over any reasonable time horizon. Now, I don't know whether that time horizon is five years or one year, or actually it's all going to change within a couple of weeks' time. But, but but there's a real mix between stuff that makes sense and stuff that is just beyond comprehension. And I think it's the beyond comprehension stuff where you really need to be engaged and interested and un try and understand who is on the other side of the trade and why are they making those trades. And I think one of the interesting points um, is the engagement of retail investors uh, in the market in recent months. I don't know whether this was catalyzed by simply the speculative era, or whether it was the change to free brokerage from a number of companies in the States, ease of access to options. But there, there's been a, a really high level of engagement from retail investors in this market. 
um, over the recent months. And that, again, is, is really interesting. The way they invest is different from some institutional investors. The type of stocks they like is different. The kind of analysis they do or don't do is also really interesting. That might be part of what this opportunity set is. But if there are millions of people investing one way and a few dozen people trying to invest the other way, it can be very dangerous um, to, to stand in the way of that, that, that path, that herd. So it's, it's a very challenging, interesting, engaging situation in the markets right now. So retail investors, it's funny you should actually mention that because I will tell you the number of conversations we're having with firms now that are investigating securities lending for the first time that actually represent uh, retail uh, client bases is is dramatic. And if I go back sort of three years ago, the number I'd, I'd spoken with was, was zero. And now there's several in discussion at, at this very moment and, and at different stages. So, so interesting you bring that because, as you say, retail investors take a different approach. Yes. And of course, you know, from a stock lending perspective, if they own uh, a different kind of share from the institution or the index fund, then actually that's really interesting from an availability of stock loan standpoint. So absolutely, from, from a, a securities lending perspective, it's really interesting and I can understand uh, this, this development. Well, in an asset gathering perspective, one of the challenges I always had as a salesperson trying to aggregate more supply for clients is that every one of the lenders I spoke with really was was tracking MSCI. So you're always looking for people to be basing themselves on other benchmarks, so their portfolios are more valuable. And obviously, retail investors take have a completely different skew, as, as you say, they invest differently to uh, institutional investors. So, so I think that's a huge trend that will continue to develop. Um, can we go uh, into maybe more about um, short selling as a strategy? So people and people often talk about it as if it's generically short selling. Short selling is this thing, you know, it's spotting Enron where there's a potential fraud and I'll just short that and wait it out. And if I can survive long enough, it'll go to zero and I win. Is, is it as simple as that? I think there are quite a few different approaches to short selling. So one of the more obvious ones is what I'll call quantitative long short, where people create portfolios of long and short positions based on a series of quantitative measures, let's say momentum or value or stock lending data or asset growth. That's one type. Another is fundamental long short, where people are doing some kind of fundamental analysis, either balance sheet analysis or a discounted cash flow to work out whether the stock is good value or not. A third type, I think, is what you describe looking for a fraud or looking for some kind of uh, issue like a, a balance sheet that's about to break and require equity issuance. Um, and I'm sure there are many other types as well, uh, but, but those, those are three different ones and they lead you into different kinds of stocks and different kinds of trading approaches. Um, uh, you know, uh, in, in a sense that makes short selling quite rich to have that complicated ecology. Um, and it also leads to a desire for people to decompose stock lending data to try to understand who are the components, what are the components of, of that stock, uh, stock lending uh, demand. Is it quantitative? Is it fundamental? Is it a mix of different types? Is it that people think it's about to go bust? Is it that people think this company's a fraud? That can really help other short sellers, but can also help inform the long investor. If there are a number of people who think the balance sheet's about to break and are willing to trade on that negative opinion, that's really valuable for a long investor in that same stock to know it tells you where you need to do your, your work, your analysis, to make sure that you think uh, the company is intact as an investment. Yeah, it's a great point that you bring out. Uh, one of our future guests has a story to tell along those, way, along those lines. We, we first met uh, as a result of uh, my blogs from whatever, uh, the, the, month, the month before Lehman defaulted. Uh, and uh, he was very anti short selling and then realized that he was doing his investors a disservice by discounting the information that it can provide and now embraces it as a directional signal. So, so it's interesting. Does that also impact uh, the, what other people are doing and the cost uh, implications and the supply and the liquidity? Does that influence your thinking when you're, when you're looking at longs and shorts? 
Yes, it does, because there's lots of evidence that um, there are signals in stock lending data. Um, so, for example, what fees people are willing to pay to borrow and how those fees are moving, um, what proportion of shares that can be borrowed actually are borrowed and changes in that utilization rate. These are quite informative signals. So there's a whole industry of people who actually collect data, uh, analyze it, and interpret it. And even um, in my firm, I have a number of colleagues who often come up to me and say, can you show me what the stock lending data is telling me about this stock because maybe it's already in their fund or they're thinking of it as a new investment. And what they're saying is, can you extract the, the juice, the interesting stuff from these big data sets and tell me what I need to know about it as a potential long investor? So I, I, I find that very interesting and very helpful to me and even to, to other long investors too. And if we go to, you know, in the past couple of weeks, we've seen the European short selling ban sort of come off. And, and obviously that's had, you know, it's brought back a number of a number of people that have been excluded from the market back into the market. So I guess a couple of questions. So this time there were fewer markets that implemented bans as opposed to the global financial crisis. So kind of question number one, I suppose, is why, why do you think there were fewer countries this time? And number two, really maybe expanding uh, what you were talking about earlier. When, when those bans came off, huge flurry of activity in, in markets where it was banned. And, and do you expect that to sort of get back to normal and, and adjust with what's happening in terms of, you know, dividends and markets and coronavirus and, and everything going on? Mm. I think the answer relates to the role and job of the, the regulator. So we mentioned earlier that the regulator, one of their roles is to try to create markets that work well in terms of liquidity and price discovering. And short selling normally helps in terms of liquidity and price discovery. But another regulatory role is to uh, ensure that uh, there is confidence in how markets work. And in the great financial crisis, so 2007 to nine, I think there was a fear that uh, confidence had broken down in markets because of problems within banking and in shadow banking where it was opaque and no one really knew what the data was. So there was a lot of fear, a lot of suspicion and a kind of belief that perhaps some people knew but most people didn't know what was going on and, and, and that creates a breakdown in market confidence. And part of walking that tight rope for the regulator was to just to work out which side of the, the, the sort of balance they want to be, better liquidity and price discovery or confidence in markets. And they chose the latter through short sale bans in scale. This time, I think we understand what caused this crisis. And we're aware that even the scientists are struggling to keep up with the knowledge, but, but it's fairly open, uh, the discussion around what the virus does, what the implications are, and, and at somewhat a level playing field. And we also can see an end to it as lockdowns uh, end, and we're aware there may be phase two and three, but, but we can see what caused it and how it ends. And that leads to less fear, plenty of uncertainty, but less fear and less suspicion that the markets are, are, are manipulated by some people who've got knowledge versus others. Uh, we're roughly all in the same boat. And for that reason, I think the regulator didn't need to do as much work to maintain market confidence, but they certainly wanted to try to keep that good liquidity and price discovery. And that's why I think on average, they've chosen a lighter route this time in terms of uh, restricting short selling. Yeah, I was listening to a video uh, of um, ShareGain, an interview by Secfin Hub uh, last week. And what ShareGain was doing was tracking over the period the performance of uh, the markets with short selling bans versus uh, the wider market and kind of created their own index of over unders. And it was interesting that the smaller markets, the Austrias, the Belgians, actually outperformed the market after putting in the ban, but the more developed markets, the larger markets, France, Italy, Spain, uh, tended to underperform. So uh, quite, quite an interesting outcome. And, and the other point that he made was that uh, as far as whatever the next crisis is, will there be even fewer uh, short-selling bans? And I think his comment was really just played out what you said, 
He said, well, it depends what the crisis is. There may be more countries that implement bans, or there might be even fewer. It depends what the crisis is. So I think you've articulated it well. Because one thing we haven't seen this time is worries about banks going out of business. Yep. Yeah. No, I, I think that's fair. And of course, we know the banks are special uh, because of their role in money creation. And uh, the last crisis was very bank oriented, but also shadow bank oriented, which was opaque. Uh, and opacity can lead to fear. And, um, uh, and that's obviously something that regulators uh, want to try to minimize where possible. I think also the regulator has learned something from the last crisis because there were plenty of academic empirical studies into whether the short selling bans worked. And generally the findings were that where a ban was implemented in a stock or a market, uh, ultimately it didn't prop up the price of that stock at all. Once uh, you actually examine the evidence, those stocks uh, continue to do badly despite having prohibitions on short selling, which suggested that actually Back to an earlier point you'd made, Roy, sometimes in a crisis, short sellers can actually be the buyer of those assets um, and um, uh, rather than someone who drives it down. Well, I think that's the, the big change for me now as opposed to 2008. And one of, the, one of my concerns in the intervening period is that when there's a market disruption right now, uh, since banks do much less, massively less, uh, proprietary trading, there are fewer buyers to step in, right? So the bank prop trading would never, you know, would would in the old days sort of jump in and look for opportunistic trades. Now stocks tend to gap down at a, at crisis points because there's less less liquidity there. And I've always been concerned about the impact that that has in in crisis points. So. Yes, and, and, and related to that, I think as well, the way market making is done nowadays is different from how it was 20 years ago. So there are far fewer dedicated or regulated uh, market makers whose job is to provide market uh, liquidity through and through. And there are more discretionary market makers, as I'll call them now, who will make markets whilst it's uh, working. And when there comes a severe shock or a risk, they're quite rightly entitled to just step away. Um, and so suddenly your market making capacity drops and that can lead to the gaps that you talked about. So a different structure of market making is related to this issue too. Yeah, and I think, I, I don't know whether you've touched on corporate bonds uh, throughout your work before, but I know that at my last firm, I spent quite a lot of time trying to add supply on uh, credit on the basis that when all of the bonds that were used to raise finance to do share buybacks and things came to a refinancing environment, it would be a more challenging marketplace. And we've seen credit downgrades and we've seen liquidity. And again, an absence of market making to the same degree as it was beforehand and largely provided as you, a great description for it, I think, discretionary market makers really. So things like like fund managers that provide liquidity because there's opportunistic trades that have no obligation to do so. So, so have you have you come across corporate bonds? Is that part of what you've looked at, or is that an input? For me, the main interest with corporate bonds is the use of indices or ETFs versus trading in the actual underlying, uh, because then you get a, a different uh, ecology of players and investors, buyers and sellers. So I think it links in with this discretionary market making. If you combine a new ecology uh, with index level or ETF buyers rather than individual asset buyers, uh, and then you link it in with discretionary market makers, you end up with something that's newish and more complicated than we had before and probably not well understood. And I take the view that anything can happen in terms of pricing when you get that kind of situation. So, um, and corporate bonds obviously is, is one area where liquidity is critical. And I guess the other thing you layer onto that is new issuance and uh, the proportion of uh, a fund manager's book that is comprised of recent new issuance of, say, corporate bonds, because there is liquidity there because the issuance itself is the liquidity event. And, and again, new issuance has been surprisingly robust at times. Again, I've, I've surprised me. Um, if, 
we've talked about a lot of the things that the regulators have as objectives, a lot of things that they've learned, how they apply them in different circumstances. But one of the things that I think came out of the GFC that uh, has concerned me uh, and is the regulatory disequilibrium between longs and positions and short positions. Since you, since you cover both, you know, I'd be interested in your thoughts because when you have to report positions, the size you have to report positions uh, in terms of thresholds and who you're disclosing to are all different on long and short. So what are your thoughts? Does that change your, your approach? I mean, what, what are you thinking there? Yeah. I mean, I, I think as an, analyst and someone who as part of my stock picking process i look at the ecology of ownership long and short different kinds of players i'd love to see more data especially on the long side in terms of who the holders are so lower thresholds for disclosure and a higher frequency of disclosures if you think of say how a lot of people get data in the states you know 13f publications um, quarterly with a big lag. I mean, the data is is it's risibly poor. So I think improved disclosure on the long side would be really helpful. I think for a stock picker and analyst who looks at shareholder registers as sources of information, we've always got fairly good data about director transactions. But I think it would be useful to have other asset holders too. On the short side, I think the regulators in Europe have probably done a good job. Again, they're walking this tightrope between two different things. On the one hand, they want to allow the short sellers to do their jobs without being the victim of predatory trading. In other words, someone very large comes and attacks their position by buying an asset that they're known to be short of, driving the price up triggering a stop loss and causing the short seller to lose money. That's unhelpful for markets um, and is a sort of game system. The regulator doesn't want that to be prevalent in a, in a large way. They'd rather have a, a properly functioning market. But at the same time, they need to have uh, to maintain confidence in markets, which requires some transparency, some level of disclosure of short positions or large short positions and, and who's behind them. I think the levels they've chosen, the sort of quarter percent disclosure to the regulator, the half a percent uh, short position uh, public disclosure is about right. I think they've got that balance about right. So I'm, I'm comfortable with the level of short disclosure available. I think we need better long disclosure. Uh, and there is an asymmetry there, absolutely. Um, we should try to, to bring those closer together, I think. Yeah, I'm not aware of anything on the horizon, though. Uh, really? yeah, no. Yeah. See, it's interesting. You know, everyone's everyone's happy to see stock markets go up, and then not too worried about uh, uh, about disclosure on, on that side. But, yeah, uh, but what, it's interesting. what we should really be interested in is seeing stock markets uh, doing an effective job at pricing assets. That that would be most helpful for society as a whole. And I think sensible information, uh, fairly symmetrical between longs and shorts, would actually assist in that task. Do the disclosure levels um, ever? enter your thinking I, i've heard other people talk at times say look we we don't have any concern reporting to regulators because our positions are our positions but we have a concern when we start getting to the public disclosure level because we still want to have access to the companies uh in order to you know discuss their plans and their strategy and their performance so we don't want it to be seen that we go overtly negative with a short position but but that skews their thinking, right? So they they stop at a position without the without the public disclosure. They might go larger. They're worried about the backlash. Is that is that a valid concern? Yeah, that feels right to me, Roy. And actually, there there has been some evidence that a number of people sit with positions, short positions, just below the regulatory public disclosure thresholds. You know, 0.49 percent or so, um, and that obviously suggests that they are swayed in their decision making by um, the need for public disclosure of their positions and the implications that has that has for um, access to companies or becoming a potential victim of predatory trading. Uh, one, one to watch, I think. Um, you touched on, I think, in your first point about the potential for abuse of short selling. Uh, I guess there's, there's two things there. One is, one is the, the actual abuse itself – 
and the fact that, as you say, uh, short sellers can be punished with short squeezes if, if the market so decides. The other point is a lot of the stories that I hear about and can remember in terms of market distor distortions is actually on the other side, where it's actually uh, you know, pump and dump stock uh, prices. So am I just being biased that I can only remember one side and see one side of the story? Um, I, I'm, I'm sure it exists on both sides, but almost by definition, it's really hard to research that topic because you just you don't get people who own up to, <laughs> to what they're doing. So you have to rely on a small number of court cases. Uh, and there are some amazing ones out there where you can actually see what's been done and where people have been convicted uh, of um, you know, pump and dump exercises and the likes. So I just take the view it's hard to really know the full extent on the long or the short side because no one owns up to it. You have to rely on a small number of cases. Um, uh, but I'm fairly confident it does exist on both sides. But if you if you think about it, there's more money to be made on long manipulation because you have unlimited upside, whereas on the short side, you're, you're capped at the 100%. So it wouldn't surprise me if there was a lot more uh, nefarious activity on the long side than the short side because of the potential payoffs. Right. And that, that leads, I think, into uh, one other question that I, that I wanted to look at. One of the concerns that I've heard expressed many times by investors that aren't lending is that they're concerned with the negative impact on the share price uh, that from their portfolio. Why would we lend securities to someone whose objective is solely to drive down the price of that stock? And, and while that's a legitimate concern, and you know, there's this sort of group of responses that we provide in terms of well, that's just another opinion, doesn't make them right or wrong. I think the uh, one of the questions is just the sheer volume of it. So to me, the volume of short selling activity is always capped by A, the total pool of securities that are available, uh, B, uh, the amount of securities that are already on loan. So new short positions, you know, probably aren't going to take uh, that big a proportion of the business unless there's new news that triggers the pricing, plus any kind of uh, restrictions that lenders place on their portfolios. Many of them have limits on how much can be loaned out. And then service providers, the agent lenders, also have their own limits. So I think by the time you look at the total free float of a stock and the number of shares that are available for short selling, it's, it, there's not really that much that can be shorted, especially if you have markets where you have to do the pre-short uh, location of available securities. Yet, you were talking earlier about people using the data for short positions as one of their indicators. Can you give me some kind of idea on, on kind of thresholds or reporting levels or where something becomes an, in, uh, an interesting short position in terms of potential for a short squeeze or a good signal that it might fall further. Can you give me any sort of, uh, sort of uh, I guess, thumbnails on that? Yeah. So I, I think there's, there's quite a few interesting things that you, you mentioned in there. So I think for people who want to lend, I think for the vast majority of your book of stocks, it, it makes good sense to lend uh, if you think you're operationally capable of it because it will bring in revenue and is very unlikely at the margin to have much material impact on price. What's different is the very small number of special cases where there's huge short interest and a real difference of opinion. And if you were a long investor and your firm lent the stock out, I think that's the, the signal that you should actually take a close look at your position and really work out what do they think they know that I don't know about this stock. And am I really confident this is a long? Do I want to lend it out? Oh, I might be able to get 5 or 8 or 10% per annum of, of stock lending revenue, but is it worth it? Could the stock halve or go bust, for example? So in a weird way, having a lending book where the bulk brings in a bit of revenue with very little risk uh, of the active manager of you know um, harm to share price, but a small number, you get a powerful signal that this is where you need to look and think again about your position. It's actually really interesting. Uh, I think in terms of thresholds on the book, I think – 
what are called special fees, the higher fees, say 5, 8, 10, 12% per annum uh, type fees. Those are interesting, and that's where people should really look. You get great revenue from lending it, but you need to be really sure um, that the balance sheet's fine, that the management are fair and, and truthful in their communication, etc. So you learn from the stock lending book where you need to, to spend your time and attention, and the fee level is one of those. The other is the utilization level, what proportion of shares that in totality can be borrowed are borrowed. And once it rises above, say, 50%, I think that's quite interesting. Once it's over 90, you'd really, really want to analyze that position and work out why almost every share that can be borrowed is borrowed by a short seller who puts themselves at risk every day expressing a negative opinion. So again, really valuable looking at things like fee levels and utilization rates to work out where there is a huge difference of opinions and a real need for a stock level analysis. Yeah, fascinating. It, it, it's always interesting to see something that started off maybe in terms of scale as a settlement efficiency enhancer is really now something that can influence both long and short position well, look, James, I've, I've taken up a whole bunch of your time today. Plus, we also got started a little bit late, so uh, my apologies for that. So I've, I've, I've had you on retainer here for quite a long time. So I'm wondering whether uh, you have any sort of closing thoughts or themes or message you want to leave with listeners. Um, well, it, it's been fascinating chatting to you, Roy. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. I think it's just that, that both long and short investors should think about um, short selling stock lending and the signals you get, whether it's from a stock lending program or watching the activities of short sellers or looking at regulatory disclosures or understanding the impact on liquidity and price discovery that short selling can have. It really is for everyone to monitor and understand, not just for a small subset of market participants, the short sellers themselves. Right, thanks. You know, tomorrow I'm speaking to a, a, a group of fiduciaries and investment consultants. And one of the points I'm going to be making is that you don't have to do securities lending, but you do certainly have to investigate it, determine whether it's appropriate for your fund, and then take whatever action you think is appropriate. You can't just automatically say, yeah, that's a great idea, let's do it. And you can't equally just say, oh, securities lending, no, no, just not interested. You actually have to investigate the value. All right. Well, listen, thanks very much, James. And that's a wrap for this podcast, Digging Into Short Selling. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. I hope you thought this was a, a, as good an episode as, as I did. Uh, the reality is that uh, James is an expert in this market. Uh, I think he shared his views on a number of really key points. And, and my takeaways are as follows. Uh, number one, we heard James explain why short selling can be challenging in terms of stock selection, market timing, and just sheer luck. And all of that's, of course, against a backdrop of a market that rises over time. So you're always fighting the market. So you have to be right. And as, uh, as we agreed, you also have to be lucky. Importantly, I think he also discussed his views on the asymmetry of the regulations in terms of disclosure limits and timing for long positions and short positions. And I thought it was really interesting that he uh, focused on the thing that needed to change was not lessening the regulation on the short side, but actually improving timing and improving disclosure for the long side. And as a long short manager, he has a, a horse in, in both races. So, you know, he thinks that there should be more disclosure, even though that would place a further obligation on him. And the third takeaway, I guess, is that he corrected me in my expectation that with the price correction that we saw in recent months, that I thought that new opportunities would be limited. It seems that the opposite is the case. He thinks that that means that we'll have some even better opportunities ahead of us. Uh, and uh, if he's right, that's a good thing for securities lenders. So that's a wrap for today's show. Uh, I hope you found it as interesting as I did. Uh, next week, I will be back with John Arneson, where we talk about the operational side of the business. I'm Roy Zimmerhansel. I'm your host. 
And thanks for listening to Peerpoint Perspectives, the podcast for people who think about securities finance and don't just do it.